Hey guys, um, today we're going to talk about diabetes and specifically diabetes um, in relation to important numbers um, that you might want to be familiar with related to diabetes. So it's always hard to remember things for class, especially when it's a bunch of different numbers. So hopefully this will help you to better understand some of those numbers that might be um, crucial for you to know um, as a nurse taking care of a patient with diabetes. Um, so first, let's talk about a normal blood glucose. Um, and um, the normal range, according to your book, is 74 to 106. And so you're going to see a variety of things for what is normal and whatever hospital you work at in the future might have a little bit of a different range. But about 70 to 100 or here 74 to 106 is, um, you know, about what we consider to be normal. Um, and so when do we usually treat it? Um, and so most hospitals that you're going to work at, um, you know, despite the fact that the high end of normal is 106, we usually don't give insulin or start trying to treat blood glucose until they're above 150. Um, as much as we don't want blood glucose to be high, we also really don't want it to be low because if it gets too low, the patient can get into a coma. So usually we start giving insulin when the blood glucose reaches around 150. Um, when it's high, um, and of course this is going to vary, there's no set number here, but usually when it's about greater than 250, that's where we consider it to be getting up pretty high. Um, and we're going to be looking for symptoms. Usually they're going to have what's called polyphagia, which is where they have a, a big hunger, they want to eat a lot, um, they're thirsty, they want to drink a lot, and they have to pee a lot. And you know, the reason for that is if you remember what happens when blood glucose gets high, that means you have a lot of sugar in your blood. And when you have a lot of sugar in your blood, um, all the water that's in your cells gets pulled into the bloodstream. And so in other words, all your cells get dehydrated, which is why you're thirsty. There's no, not enough or no glucose in your cells. So that's why you're hungry. Your cells are like, feed me. I need more glucose. But all the glucose is in the blood, not in the cells. And then you pee a lot because you're take, you're sucking all that water out of the cells um, and you have all this extra glucose. So your kidneys are like, we got to get rid of all this extra stuff. So it starts peeing and peeing and peeing it out. Um, when it gets low, we usually consider low to be like less than 70. Um, and when it gets to that number, you're going to think of that, you know, the whole cold and clammy, give me candy. They're tired, tired, irritable, and sweaty. And so what happens is, again, kind of think about like how when your blood glucose is too high, you don't have enough glucose for the cell because everything's in the blood. But when your blood glucose is low, there's not enough blood glucose, uh, blood glucose in the cell either. So you're tired, you're irritable. You can also be hungry. Um, and sweaty. You get diaphoretic because what happens is your body's like, I need energy. I don't have that sugar that I need. So it starts to activate that sympathetic nervous response where your heart rate goes up and um, everything starts going go, 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 go to try to you know make up for the fact that you don't have that glucose that you're needing. So as a whole, just to kind of sum this up, that normal is 74 to 106. Um, and usually we don't really start treating it until it's about at 150. Um, what a high blood glucose, like what I would say is, oh man, that's high. It's usually like around 250 and higher. Um, and then when it's usually considered low is less than 70. Um, and you know, that's where they kind of get tired, irritable, sweaty. Um, yeah. Well, there's other PowerPoints that talk more about when things get too high and too low. So I definitely look into those if you have any questions about that. Those are some numbers that should help get you started with that. So let's talk about hemoglobin A1C. So what is this number? So that's HGA1C that stands for hemoglobin A1C. So it is um, a measure of the percentage of hemoglobin that are saturated with glucose. Now that's a really big fancy way of saying that in your blood you have hemoglobin. You know, that's that thing that carries oxygen around the rest of your body. But when I have, to, if I was diabetic and I had too much blood glucose in my blood, my body is gonna try to find ways to get rid of it. It can't get it into the cell because there's not enough insulin um, or um, the cells aren't responding to insulin. So I have all this excess of glucose. So what am I going to do with it? One of the ways your body starts to, you know, try to get rid of it is it actually attaches it to hemoglobin. So in other words, it's kind of like um, on top of carrying around oxygen, hemoglobin starts to carry around glucose, um, you know, and just kind of giving it a ride around town, you know, and so, um, you know, effectively what a hemoglobin A1C is measures is how much extra glucose is attaching 
attaching to that hemoglobin because normally you're not going to have very high levels of sugar on your hemoglobin. It should be a very, very low percentage, percentage. but it, when you have hyperglycemia, especially over time, you're going to see that there's more glucose attaching to that, those hemoglobin molecules. Um, and so, and the great thing about this test is compared to just checking a blood glucose, which tells you what's my sugar right now, a hemoglobin A1C actually tells you how have you been for the last 90 days? Because if you'll remember back to your patho and, um, you know, the, some of some of the AMP from years ago, um, is, is that uh, red blood cells, you know, they stay in your body for about 90 days or about like two to three months. Um, and so um, because they stay in your body that long, when you're looking at the percentage of sugar on these, uh, these hemoglobin, and you're actually seeing how much sugar has been on for the last 45 to 90 days. You actually get to see not just how well are they doing today, but how well is this patient managing the glucose in their body over the last few months. So this is a test you can't cheat. Um, so this is one of the standard methods we use to kind of see how people are doing. So for a nor normal person who doesn't have diabetes, who's managing their glucose well, able to get that glucose into the cell, they should only have four to 5.6% uh, 5.6% of their hemoglobin be saturated with, um, with glucose. Um, when people start to get pre-diabetic, they usually have about 57 to 6.4% of their hemoglobin has that glucose on it. And um, we consider anything less than seven to be good diabetic control. So if a patient has diabetes, our goal is to keep that hemoglobin A1C above, uh, or sorry, less than seven. Um, and so anything that gets above that, you know, when people come in and they just haven't been managing their diabetes late, uh, well, I mean, I've seen it as high as 20%. That's a lot of glucose on our hemoglobin. That's not where it's supposed to be. Um, so yeah, so as a whole, this kind of just tells us how much glucose is hanging around our system, or in other words, how much excess do I have? And so it really tells me how well that the patient is, um, you know, uh, sticking to their diet, taking their medications and um, keeping up with things. And, you know, even if they're doing all of that and their hemoglobin A1C is still high, then maybe there's something off with their medications and the doctor needs to adjust something. So anyway, um, but hopefully that makes sense. We also have um, what's called a oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and for this test, this is kind of, if you've ever been um, pregnant, um, this is kind of like that um, glucose test that they do for you to see how well that your um, body handles sugar. So kind of backing up a little bit, we looked at the regular blood glucose numbers that, um, you know, 74 to 106, like that's just what is my blood glucose right now? Then we just talked about a hemoglobin A1C, which is how has my blood glucose been over the past few months? Then there's what's called an oral glucose tolerance test. And what this test tells me is how well is my insulin response or how is my body responding to glucose in general? Um, and so what this test is, is that the patient takes in some oral, like a big, like swig, it's usually like a sugar filled drink. Um, they, they test their blood glucose before they take that drink. And then like one hour later, two hours later, and sometimes more than that. Um, and just see like, you know, how their body's responding. Cause if I had, um, you know, good insulin response and uh, my body was managing my glucose well, then that number, um, should be normal to start. And then, um, as I take Take that glucose in. It may be high at first, but it should be going down at a steady rate. Um, so in other words, like, you know, if I take glucose into my system, if my body is like insulin resistant, really struggling, you know, like that's usually a sign that, you know, like my body's just not processing things. Well, remember we talked about insulin resistance, which is where, you know, pretty much insulin's there. It's present. It's trying to help, but that the cells are pretty much like, no, 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 no. You're not going to stick that glucose in my cell. I'm over you. You've been using me too much. It's pretty much where the cells start to turn off or say, I'm not going to open my door for um, insulin because I've, I'm overworked, you know, like they've been, um, there's so much sugar that you've been ingesting that it's just overwhelmed. Um, but this is a really good way to see kind of how in general is your body working. And this could actually help to better tailor treatment for a patient who maybe, um, uh, what he caught is um, we're trying to figure out what the best medication is for them, especially like in type two diabetes. And there's certain medications that actually target this, that will help your cells to become more sensitive to insulin again. So if this is a problem you're having, this is a great way for doctors to kind of know. So this isn't just used in pregnancy. It's also used for diabetes. Um, you can see here kind of what is expected um, for a patient who's coming with the oral glucose tolerance test fasting. We hope that their blood glucose should be less than 110 after an hour um, taking in that glucose glucose, it should be um, less than 180. Then after two hours, it should still be decreasing and it should be less than 140. 
Um, and so that kind of tells us how well um, the cells are responding to insulin or the body's handling this excess of glucose. So let's talk about some numbers related to blood glucose and exercise. So the general recommendation for diabetics um, uh, for exercise to help support a healthy um, blood glucose is to do about 150 minutes per week, which ends up being about 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, uh, patients should always check their blood glucose before they exercise. Um, if their blood glucose is on the lower end, less than 100, they should eat 15 grams of carbs and recheck. They should not exercise if their blood glucose is less than 100. And that's because, you um, know, they might seem like, hey, that's, that's, normal, like that's in the normal range. But you know, a lot of people misunderstand this, they think like when you exercise, like you're stressed out, so that, um, you know, you have more glucose. But the truth is, is you're using more glucose, your body's using all of its expenditures. So if my blood glucose is already kind of on the low end of normal, um, and I'm using a whole lot to exercise, um, then I could get hypoglycemic and go into a coma and have a lot of issues. So we want to make sure their blood glucose is greater than 100 before where they exercise. Um, type one, uh, for type one diabetics, um, we also wanna consider that if their blood glucose is too high, so if it's greater than 250 and ketones are present, um, they should do no vigorous activity and drink lots of fluids. And so a lot of people get confused by this because they're like, wait, I thought you wanted to have enough sugar to exercise and you do. But here's the thing, for type one diabetics, if they get to a state of dehydration, which if there's ketones present in their urine, then that's usually, a, um, that's not usually, that is a sign of dehydration. Um, then they can end up going into diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a crisis of type 1 diabetes. Um, and so um, as a whole, um, you know, we want them to kind of stay ahead of this, and which is why we'd want them to drink a lot of fluids if this is um, true. A lot of people ask, well, how would they check their ketones? There's a ton of ketone strips that you can buy at home to see if you are, um, you know, people do them all the time for the keto diet, but you can also see if ketones are present um, uh, for type 1. Um, there is a home urine test that the patient can do. Um, but as a whole, effectively, we don't want their blood glucose to be too low before exercise because they're going to need that extra glucose. But we also don't want them to be dehydrated and have a high blood glucose and ketones present. And the ketones present is only going to be for type 1 diabetics because remember, they're the ones that make no insulin because they make zero insulin. Um, what do you call it? That's where they get to that point where they, um, you know, start to go to a different type of metabolism that makes ketones and that can put them into that acidosis. Um, but yeah, that's the, the kind of the basics for blood glucose and exercise. Um, so let's also talk about when to give insulin. And there's also going to be a completely separate PowerPoint that just talks about, um, you know, all about insulin. But um, here's some numbers that might help. Um, so these are the different things that you want to kind of keep in mind when you're giving insulin. For rapid insulin, there's three numbers that you want to kind of keep in mind. First, you want to know when do I need to feed the patient? I want to feed them within 15 minutes. Yes, there is a range, but keep in mind, you always want to know that start time. So that if you give that insulin, if I give rapid insulin, um, I need to know when do I need to have their tray there. So in other words, if I am about to give rapid insulin, I'm not going to give it if the trays haven't arrived to the floor yet, because then that I might give that insulin and then the patient doesn't have um, the food that they're going to need. And then that medication starts taking effect and they can have a hypoglycemic episode. Um, the, the second part of rapid insulin says that my sugar is most likely to be low. So what is this talking about? This is talking about the peak of this medication. So while I do need to feed them within 15 minutes, between 30 minutes and three hours of giving that rapid insulin, that's when I'm going to be wanting to look for hypoglycemia because that's that biggest risk period. That's when the peak of the medication is going to be acting. And they can have hypoglycemia up to five hours. That's the duration. So the three numbers that I'm looking at here is the onset, the peak and the duration. And that for rapid, I want to know when I need to feed them. That's the onset. Uh, when uh, it peaks, that's the highest chance they're going to have a hypoglycemic episode. And then how long are they going to be at risk for hypoglycemia? And so for rapid, it's going to be five hours. For short acting, this is similar, except you want to feed them within 30 minutes. That peak or that time when they're going to be most at risk for hypoglycemia is going to be about two to five hours. And then, um, you know, that duration is going to be up to eight hours. So I want to be watching them for that hypoglycemia for that eight hours. 
Now you can see for the next couple, they don't have three. And that's because the first two are what are called, and I'll go more into this in the insulin thing. The first two are what are called um, bolus insulin. So I give them around meal times to cover for that spike I'm gonna have when I'm eating. But the intermediate acting and long acting insulin are going to be my basal insulin. So they're the ones that are gonna kind of keep my blood glucose stable. So I don't need to necessarily eat right after, but I need to make sure that the patient has, has had a snack or um, I'm checking their blood glucose during that peak time, um, which, you know, like for the intermediate acting is going to be from four to 12 hours. And so, cause um, keep in mind this. So these medications, they don't have a rapid onset, um, but when they do um, have this peak period, the patient could be at risk for hypoglycemia. So I want to like, usually a lot of these medications, the intermediate and long acting are given at night or in the morning. So I just want to be checking during this peak time to make sure um, that uh, the patient's not having any hypoglycemia. So for example, with the NPH, um, if I was giving that at nine o'clock at night, I would need to check the patient's blood glucose around two or three in the morning so that I could make sure that they weren't having a drop. And a lot of times if I'm going to give this at night, I'm going to give them a snack at night to make sure that they stay up. But anyway, I'm getting off the topic a little bit. Let's just stick to the numbers here. So intermediate acting, um, the peak or when they're most at risk for hypoglycemia is four to 12 hours. So I want to check in that period and make sure that their blood glucose is staying stable. And they can actually have hypoglycemia for up to 18 hours. So I definitely need to keep a regular monitor on this um, if they're taking that. And then long acting, there's no peak. I don't need to worry about the onset, but it can last up for 24 hours. So I definitely want to keep an eye on the blood glucose over time um, to make sure they're not having any lows. So I hope this was helpful um, and didn't get you more confused, but these are some numbers that you might want to be familiar with to um, better help you take care of patients with diabetes. I'll see you next time.